Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Credit Transactions. This evening, we will be discussing deposits. So before we discuss, let's have first the University of the Visayas prayer, the mission, vision, as well as the core values of the University of the Visayas. The University of the Visayas Prayer Lord, fill our hearts with your precious gifts. Let us overcome our weaknesses with your strength this very day, that we may fulfill all the duties of our state conscientiously, that we may do what is right and just. Let our charity be such as to offend no one and hurt no one's feelings so generous as to pardon sincerely any wrong done to us. Lord, grant us the serenity to accept the things that we cannot change, courage to change the things that we can, and wisdom to know the difference. Graciously hear us, O Lord, and pour your light into our hearts and minds. Assist us today to grow in goodness and grace. Amen. The University. Okay, good evening once again. Before we discuss deposits, allow me to highlight first some of the cases that we stated in our notes. No, the first one is Dariunakar versus Gallery Frames. This was decided in August 13, 2013, wherein the Supreme Court said that the 6% per annum rate of legal interest shall be applied prospectively to the effect that final and executory judgments awarding damages prior to July 1, 2013 shall apply the 12% rate. According to the Supreme Court, final and executory judgments awarding damages on one hand on or after July 1, 2013 shall apply the 12% rate for unpaid obligations until June 30, 2013. When respect or with respect to unpaid obligations with respect to the said judgments on or after July 1, 2013, it shall incur the 6% rate. So remember the distinction, guys, uh, if it's after July 1, 2013, the legal interest is 6% per annum. If it's prior to July 1, 2013, that is June 30, 2013, paubos, that is 12% per annum. That's the legal rate, all right? Another case that I want you to remember is this, Catalina Isla, Elizabeth Isla and Gilbert Isla versus Genevera Estorga decided in July 2, 2018, wherein the Supreme Court um, distinguished monetary from compensatory interest. So ninyo ng Supreme Court here na in cases where no monetary interest had been stipulated by the parties, ato na yung na-mention last meeting, when it comes to monetary interest, mauni siya ang gi-specify sa balaod nga cannot be claimed by the creditor if it is not stipulated in writing, okay? Ningon in this case, in cases where no monetary interest had been stipulated by the parties, no accrued monetary interest could further earn compensatory interest upon judicial demand. Thus, the principal amount and monetary interest due to respondents shall earn compensatory interest of 12% per annum from judicial demand. That is the date of the filing of the complaint on July 24, 2007 up to June 30, 2013. And thereafter, at the rate of 6% per annum from July 1, 2013 until it is fully Paid, okay, so um, I want you to read the full text of this case in order to have a better understanding of Catalina Isla et al. versus Genevera Estorga. So that's it for, for loans. We'll now proceed with the discussion tonight, and that is deposit. That's from Articles 1962 to 2009. Okay, 
Um, let's start off with deposit in general and its different kinds. Article 1962 provides that a deposit is constituted from the moment a person receives a thing belonging to another with the obligation of safely keeping it and of returning the same. If the safe keeping of the thing delivered is not the principal purpose of the contract, there is no deposit but some other contract. Remember in Article 1964 that the principal purpose of the delivery of the thing is for safekeeping. Mogina ang pinaka purpose why there is deposit, safekeeping. But suppose the depositary has the right to use the thing deposited. Can you still consider that contract a contract of deposit? Yes, as long as the principal purpose is safekeeping, although it is called now an irregular deposit. Okay, example ani kanang car. Okay, for a car show, that could be an example. Um, the principal purpose is really for safekeeping, but um, it can be used. Kung na car show, masya pwede. For the meantime, ako sang gamitan for a car show. But still, the principal purpose is safekeeping. It could be that a car may be used, pwede ni mong paandaron for purposes of preservation. That is still deposit. Okay, necessary man siya for the preservation of the thing. In Article 1972, when the preservation of the thing deposited requires its use, it must be used, but only for that purpose. Okay. In other words, the principal purpose of the contract of deposit, as what we've said earlier, is safekeeping of the thing delivered. Okay. So that if safekeeping is only an accessory or secondary obligation of the recipient of the thing, deposit is not constituted but some other contract. It could either be lease or comodatum or agency as the case may be. But remember, kung ang principal gani, balik ko na to, kung ang principal purpose nga nung na-constitute ang contract of deposit is for safekeeping, that is, of course, a contract of deposit. Now on to the characteristics of a contract of deposit. Uh, um, it is very um, important now when you take up the subject, mobitong prerequisite ng oblicon. It is important that you still have with you your knowledge in oblicon para mas dali mong makasabot aning deposit and other transactions in credit transactions because ang obligations here kay mo balik kriyapon sa mga general rule and the general rule and the basic principles are actually stated in oblicon. So when it comes to deposit, one of the characteristics of a contract of deposit is it is a real contract, like that of komodatum and, com and mutuum, because it is perfected by the delivery of the subject matter of the contract. Okay, ma perfected lang na ang contract of deposit upon the delivery because it is a real contract. Another characteristic is it is generally a unilateral contract, it gives rise to the principal obligations on the part of the depository to safely keep the thing and return it. It is only when the depositor has agreed to pay remuneration to the depository that the contract will become bilateral and onerous as the depositor assumes a primary obligation. Another characteristic is it is nominate. It is a nominate contract because gitagaan siyang pangan under the civil code. It has been given a specific name in the civil code, and that is deposit. Okay. Another thing is it is a principal contract because an existence of deposit does not depend on the existence of another contract. So bisagulay laing kontrata, the contract of deposit can it can stand on its own, and it is a principal contract. Another characteristic is it is an informal contract. Ganuman because no particular form is required by or for the contract to be considered valid. And lastly, it is generally a gratuitous contract. It is gratuitous because the depositor here does not pay compensation to the depositary, but it could also be an onerous contract. It can happen no? um, when there is, a, there is a consideration or when the depositary is engaged in the business of storing goods, which we will discuss later on. So remember, nga a contract of deposit has been defined as a principal, a real, 
unilateral or bilateral gratuitous or onerous contract whereby a person delivers to another a thing for safekeeping and custody with the latter having the obligation to return the thing when claimed. Okay, I hope clear na ang mga characteristics. These are basic but um, it's important nga makabaw mo ana for you to be able to understand of course the subsequent provisions of the contract of deposit. Now on to the essential requisites of contract. Habaw na mo sa um, um, requisites of a contract. Daba? Katong consent, object, and of course the cost or the obligate cost of the obligation. Um, pareha rasad sa contract of deposit. Ang essential elements sa contract of deposit is this, the consent of the contracting parties. And in your obliquon, you learn that consent is manifested by the meeting of the offer and acceptance upon the thing and the cost which are to constitute the contract. So consent uh, in your obliquon may be manifested either expressly or tacitly. Another essential requisite is the object certain, which is the subject of the or the subject matter of the contract. Remember na in Article 1962 in extrajudicial um, deposit, only movable things capable of being delivered may be the object of deposit. Okay, there may be a contract for the custody and safekeeping of immovable property, pero dili na siya contract of deposit under this article, under Article 1962. Mafall na siya sa Article 2006. Unsa man day na sa Article 2006, makita ninyo diha nga in sequestration or judicial deposit, movable as well as immovable property may be its object. Okay? Unya, hinumdumi sa ninyo in your oblikon nga an object to a contract must be within the commerce of men. Ayaw ng mga impossibly. It has to be determinate. Okay? And then another essential requisite of a contract of deposit is the cost of the obligation which is established. The cost here is that it is gratuitous. Okay, The deposit is essentially gratuitous. In which case, the cost here is the mere liberality of the depositor. However, as what I've mentioned earlier, a deposit is an onerous contract when the depository is given or is paid fees or when the depository is engaged in the business of storing goods. And another special um, requisite here in the contract of deposit is delivery. Delivery of the thing is also an essential requisite of this contract because the delivery by the depositor of the thing to the depository is the one that actually transfers possession of the thing in the concept of deposit. Without the delivery, the depositor will not be able to comply with its obligation of safely keeping the thing and returning it. So remember, essential requisites, consent of the contracting parties, the object certain, which is the subject matter of the contract, the cause of the obligation, which is established, and then, of course, delivery. All right? Now, you might ask, what's my distinction between deposit from that of mutuum. In deposit, the principal purpose is safekeeping or mere custody of the thing deposited. While in mutuum, the, the principal purpose is consumption of the subject matter. Okay. Another distinction is that in deposit, the depositor can actually demand the return of the subject matter at will. While in comodatum, the lender must wait until the expiration of the period granted to the debtor. And lastly, in deposit, both movable and immovable property may be the object. Okay, pwedeng movable and immovable when it comes to judicial deposit. Um, while in mutuum, only money or other consumable thing may be the object of the contract. And how about the distinction between deposit and that of comodato? In deposit, the as what we said earlier, the principal purpose is safekeeping. In comodatum, ang purpose niya is the transfer of the use. Okay, transfer of the use. In deposit, it may be gratuitous. In comodatum, essentially and always gratitude. I mean, gratuitous siya. 
always, essentially, and always gratuitous. In extrajudicial deposit, only movable things may be its object. Well, in comodatum, both um, movable and immovable property may be the object. You have to distinguish ha, between extrajudicial, as what we mentioned earlier, katong 1962, and that of judicial um, deposit, which we will, of course, discuss later on. Now on to Article 1963. Okay, Article 1963 provides that an agreement to constitute a deposit is binding, but the deposit itself is not perfected until the delivery of the thing. Monia tungis gutan ganiha since it is a real contract, therefore it is perfected only upon the delivery of the object of the contract. Okay, wala tanag bot bot ganiha when we said that these are the characteristics of a real or of a deposit or of a contract of deposit. Nana siya. It's provided for in Article 1963. Now on 1964, it, st it states that a deposit may be constituted judicially or extrajudicially. A deposit may be created by virtue of a court order or by law and not by the will of the parties. Mo na nga, if you notice, in Article 1962, when it defines deposit, and in Article 1964, when it classified deposit into judicial and extrajudicial, it used the term deposit is constituted or deposit may be constituted because there can be an instance wherein it may be constituted not really by the will of the parties, but by virtue of a court order or by law. Okay? In this article, niingon siya nga Ningon siya nga ang deposit may be judicial or extrajudicial deposit. When we talk about judicial deposit, it is one which actually takes place when an attachment or seizure of property in litigation is ordered. Okay, is ordered. So I want you now to jump to articles 2005 to 2009. 2009 is guys. Okay. Para na mo'y um, bird's eye view of what are the examples of a judicial deposit. In Article 2005, it states that a judicial deposit or sequestration takes place when an attachment or seizure of property in litigation is ordered. Okay? Um, so man attachment or seizure of, of property. Um, there can be an instance wherein there is a case, let's say, um, collection of sum of money. And then, wala tanawron sa complainant or the plaintiff, walay mabayad si defendant or the debtor in this case. But kibaw siya nga na property. So if ma-identify ni mo na ang property, pwede na siyang i-attach. And the, the court can say, okay, um, by virtue of the attachment, um, dapat a judicially deposit na siyang a certain property. The purpose of the judicial deposit is to protect the rights of the parties. Now, in case of um, insolvency on the part of the debtor and the part of the depositor, na ay property mga magamit para to satisfy the judgment of the court. So, mo na siya basically ang ang example sa attachment or seizure of property in litigation. Um, basically, that's judicial deposit, wherein it could happen um, when the object is either movable or immovable property. So in 2006, Article 2006, you will see here that movable as well as immovable property may be the object of sequestration. So it doesn't matter kung immovable or movable, pwede na siya as long or when it comes to judicial deposit. Now, the depository of property or object sequestered cannot be relieved of his responsibility until the controversy which gave rise thereto has come to an end unless the court so orders. The depository of property sequestered is bound to comply with respect to the same with all the obligations of a good father of a family. And in 2009, Article 2009, it states that as to matters not provided for in this code, judicial sequestration shall be governed by the rules of court. You will have an exhaustive um, discussion of judicial 
um, sequestration or judicial deposit or sequestration in your remedial law. So in order for us not to have an overlap of the discussion, I will just leave you to it. Um, um, at least na lang mo idea on what are the examples of a judicial deposit. So let's now go back to Article 1964. We already know kung unsa ang judicial deposit. You already know what are the instances. Or we already have an idea of, of the instances kung kano sa mo take place ang judicial deposit. Now let's um, move on to extrajudicial deposit. Di ba? Niingon ni Article 1964 nga it could either be judicial or extrajudicial deposit. But in extrajudicial deposit, Article 1967, if you look at it, Article 1967 further classifies extrajudicial deposit into that of voluntary or necessary. Kung voluntary, it is one wherein the delivery is made by the will of the depositor or by two or more persons, each of whom believes himself entitled to the thing deposited. Maoni ang nasa articles 1968 to 1995. Okay, you will we will be discussing that um later on ng tagsa tagsa. Okay, ang voluntary deposit you will see this in articles 1968 to 1995. Necessary deposit on one hand is made in compliance with the legal obligation, or on the occasion of any calamity, or by the travelers in hotels and inns or by travelers with common carriers. So later, ato sa nang i-discuss tagsa-tagsa ang provisions on necessary deposits. Kiti man iha, um, ang deposit is, maybe is or may be constituted um, either judicially or extrajudicially. Onya, ang extrajudicial deposit is either so to, voluntary or necessary. Okay, tagsa-tagsa o na na to. Onya. Now on to 1965, um, as what we've mentioned in the characteristics of a contract of deposit, it is a gratuitous contract, okay? Except when there is an agreement to the contrary or unless the depositary is engaged in the business of storing goods. I think that's self-explanatory. 1966, um, we also mentioned this, that only movable things may be the object of a deposit, okay? Remember yun, nga only movable or personal property may be the object of extrajudicial deposit, whether it be voluntary or necessary, timan e nga because ang purpose niya is for safekeeping of the thing, so kailangan matransfer sa iya ha, it has to be delivered, so the concept is that um, movable siya or personal property siya. Pero in judicial deposits, um, as what we have discussed earlier in Articles 2005 to 2009, they may cover movable as well as immovable property. Its purpose being to protect the rights of the parties to a suit. All right? And we also discussed this, that, a, ex, that an extrajudicial deposit is either voluntary or necessary. Okay? Um, we're done with this. Let's now proceed to voluntary deposit. So, on summoning voluntary deposit, Article 1968 provides that a voluntary deposit is that wherein the delivery is made by the will of the depositor. A deposit may also be made by two or more persons, each of whom believes himself entitled to the thing deposited with a third person who shall deliver it in a proper case to the one to whom it belongs, okay? As what we have mentioned earlier, a voluntary deposit is one wherein the delivery is made by the will of the depositor. Ang pinaka-distinction, Annie, with that of necessary deposit is that in voluntary deposit, the depositor has complete freedom in choosing the depository. Pero in necessary deposit, wala na siyang klase of freedom. There is lack of free choice on the part of the depositor when it comes to um, necessary deposit. Now on to Article 1969. 
Article 1969 provides that a contract of deposit may be entered into orally or in writing. Okay, orally or in writing. As um, what you have recalled in your obliquon, di ba? Um, as a rule, contracts are obligatory in whatever form they may have um, been entered into, provided that all the essential requisites for their validity are present. So following this rule in your obliquon, there is no formal requisite when it comes to deposit. This article would tell us that a deposit may be entered into orally or in writing. I'd also like to emphasize that since deposit is a real contract, delivery of the thing is what actually perfects the contract, okay? While it may be true that there may be an agreement between the parties to constitute a deposit prior to delivery, still, it is the delivery that actually perfects the contract of deposit. So, um, usasan siya sa mga characteristics wherein a contract of deposit is an informal um, contract. It doesn't have a formal requisite in order for it to be considered valid or perfected. And then this one, um, if a person having capacity to contract accepts a deposit made by one who is incapacitated, the former shall be subject to all the obligations of a depositary. Kisay per, um, former dere, ang person having the capacity to contract. Okay? And may be compelled to return the thing by the guardian or administrator of the person who made the deposit or by the latter himself if he should acquire capacity. Okay? Kani ko no? Um, suppose si Jim, a 14-year-old boy, delivered an object to Marco, a 50-year-old man for safekeeping. Who can demand the return of the thing? In Article 1970, um, you would see here nga even if Si Jim here is incapacitated. Ningo ng balaod nga, if the person having the capacity to contract accepts a deposit made by one who is incapacitated, the former shall be subject to all the obligations of a depositary. So, si Marco here is still obliged to perform all the obligations of a depositary. And in this instance, si Marco may be compelled to return the thing by the guardian or administrator of the person who made the deposit, or by the depositor himself if he should acquire capacity. Okay? Ito lang ipang run through because these are just the um, basic principles in deposit. In um, So let's now go to 1971. In 1971, it provides that if the deposit has been made by a capacitated person with another who is not, the depositor shall only have an action to recover the thing deposited while it is still in the possession of the depositary or to compel the latter to pay him the amount by which he may have enriched or benefited himself with the thing or its price. However, if a third person who acquired the thing acted in bad faith, the depositor may bring an action against him for its recovery. In the previous um, article, ang, in, ang incapacitated dito is the depositor. Here, in this article, ang incapacitated here is the depositary. So, under this article, ngayon siya generally, si incapacitated depositary like that of a minor or insane person does not incur the obligation of a depositary. Bali siya. Okay? He does not incur the obligation of a depositary. However, however, he is liable to first return the thing deposited while it is still in his possession. And if the thing deposited is no longer in his possession, to pay the depositor the amount by which he may have benefited himself with the thing or its price subject to the right of any third person which acquired the thing in good faith. Okay? So my example, Ani. Example is this. Kung si Marco deposited a watch with Jim, a miner, who sold it 
to Alvin, unsa may mahimong obligasyon ni Alvin in this case? Kung si Alvin is in bad faith, if he acted in bad faith, si Marco may recover the watch from him. But if Alvin in this case acted in good faith, Marco's only recourse is against Jim to compel Jim to return the price received for the watch or the amount by which he may have benefited himself. Okay, so that's just an, that's just the simple illustration of Article 1971. Um, later on, we will be discussing some of the cases that I have um, come across in relation to the contract of deposit. Na na tong mga basic principles and then we go to the cases. Okay? Um, so, unsa man din mga obligations sa depository? What are the obligations of the depository? Article 1972 says that the depository is obliged to keep the thing safely and to return it when required to the depositor or to his heirs and successors or to the person who may have been designated in the contract. His responsibility with regard to the safekeeping and the loss of the thing shall be governed by the provisions of the Title I of this book. That's Oblicon. Okay? Um, further, ng Article 1972, na if the deposit is gratuitous, this fact shall be taken into account in determining the degree of care that the depositary must observe. All right. So, on sa may mga principal obligations di ay sa depositary. These are the principal obligations of a depositary: the obligation to keep the thing, the obligation not to use the thing, the obligation to return the thing. Now, in relation to keeping the thing, okay, the depositary has the following related obligations: to keep the thing safely, not to deposit the thing with a third person. Dilipwede not change the way of the deposit, and to collect interest on certificates when they become due and preserve the value of securities. Also, one of the obligations of the depository is not to commingle grains and other articles of the same kind and quality if there is a stipulation to that effect. Okay? Now, as regards to the obligation to return the thing, the depository here has the obligation to return the thing with all its products, accessories, and accessions, as well as return the thing closed and sealed if delivered in such condition. You will um, see um, these in Articles 1962, 1972, 1977. So just browse through those articles. Um, in order for you to have a better grasp of these obligations of the depository. Um, now on to the obligation to keep the thing deposited and to return it. Um, what's my degree of care um, required of a depository? Ordinarily, the, deposit, the depositor must exercise over the thing deposited the same diligence as he would exercise over his property. This should mean depositary. Had depositary must exercise over the thing deposited the same amount of diligence as he may have um, or as he would have um, exercised if it were his property. Okay? Um, because according to Dillion, um, it is an essential requisite of a judicial relation which actually involves the depositor's confidence in good faith and trustworthiness. And also because of the presumption that the depositor in choosing the depositary took into account the diligence which the depositary is accustomed with respect to his own property. Naturally. Now, on some kay mga rules that could apply when it comes to the degree of care um, when it comes to the contract of deposit. There are several um, articles that we could actually apply. These are articles 1163, 1170, 1173, 
um, most of these articles are from Oblicon because of, as what I've said earlier, it's very important no, na you remember these basic principles in Oblicon. Kay kana siya ang mga basic principles sa Oblicon. Mo po na yung mga principles magamit in credit transactions because this is a transaction. This is a contract. Okay, basically na two parties and they have obligations. Kung sa may basihan na to, of course, the law on obligations and contracts. Okay, if you remember, Article 1163 says that every person obliged to give something is also obliged to take care of it with the proper diligence of a good father of a family. Unless ang law mismo or ang stipulation of the parties requires another standard of care. Article 1170, um, you can go to Article 1170. Ningo those who in the performance of their obligations are guilty of fraud, negligence, or delay, and those who in the manner contravene the tenor thereof are liable for damages. Okay? In, in 1265, Ningo na, now whenever the thing is lost in the possession of the debtor, it shall be presumed that the loss was due to his fault unless there's proof to the contrary and without prejudice to the provisions of Article 1165, okay? Um, just browse through those articles in order for you to be reminded of the obligations of the parties when it comes to a contract or transaction, as the case may be, okay? Also remember that the required degree of care is greater if the deposit is made for compensation than when it is gratuitous okay also another thing if there's a provision on the return before a specified term the thing deposited must be returned to the depositor whenever he claims it even though a specified term or time for such may have been stipulated in the contract you might ask unsa may dapat a return what must be returned the depositary must return the thing received together with all its products, accessories, and accessions. Okay? Um, accessories and accessions. Um, exception lang yun ani, guys, is ang Article 1976. Okay? Article 1976. In Article 1976, kung ang depositary was not prohibited from commingling grains, and other articles of the same kind and quality, then the depositary must return an article of the same kind of and quality. Also, in Article 1990, if the depositary by force majeure loses the thing and receives money or another thing in its place, he must deliver the same um, sum of money or other thing received to the depositor. Okay? Also, um, na po yung instance in Article 1991, if ang depositary's heir would sell the thing deposited, and then um, the 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 sale was actually done in good faith, not knowing that the thing was merely deposited, he is only bound to return the price that he may have received. Okay, so these are just some of the examples generally. Imong iulit good ang thing na receive together its products, accessions, and um, accessions and accessories. But there are um, certain or several ex exceptions, such as Articles 1976, 1990, and that of 1991. Okay. Now, kisa may imong ulian, to whom should it be returned? As a rule, the depository must return the thing to the depositor or to his heirs and successors or to the person who may have been designated by the court, okay? Now, what is the effect in case of breach of the obligation to return? Um, the law says that if the depositary fails to return the thing, then his liability will be governed by the general provisions on obligations under Title I, Book Four of the Civil Code. Okay?
Also, the depository can also be held liable no, in case of breach of the obligation to return. The depository can also be held liable, thank you, criminally for staff should he appropriate the thing. Okay? So, timan na ninyong mga obligations sa depository in case of his failure to return the thing deposited. Okay? Now, may the depository deposit the thing with a third person. Pwede ba nga ikaw ang gidepositohan? Unya imo sang i-deposit further. Pwede? Article 1973 would tell us that unless there's a stipulation to the contrary, the depository cannot deposit the thing with a third person. If deposit to the third person is allowed, the depository is liable for the loss if he deposited the thing with a person who is manifestly careless or unfit. The depository is responsible for the negligence of his employees. All right? Okay, I'll repeat that. Um, audio Okay. Suppose the thing was deposited with a third person and it was allowed to be deposited, but the thing was lost. Is a depository liable for damages? In this case, you have to qualify your answer. Okay. The depositor is not responsible in case the thing is lost without negligence of the third person with whom he was allowed to deposit. The thing, if such third person is manifestly, is not manifestly careless or unfit, okay? Otherwise, liable siya, right? So I hope that's clear. Let's now go to Article 19, um, 1974, okay? Article 1974 provides that the depository may change the way of the deposit if under such um, or if under the circumstances he may reasonably presume that the depositor would consent to the change if he knew of the facts of the situation. However, before the depositary may make such change, he shall notify the depositor thereof and wait for his decision unless delay would cause um, danger. Um, let's, let, let's read further Article 1975. Um, the depository holding certificates, bonds, securities, or instruments which earn interest shall be bound to collect the latter when it becomes due and to take such steps as may be necessary in order that the securities may preserve their value and the rights corresponding to them or to them according to the law. The above provision shall also or shall not apply two contracts for the rent of safety deposit boxes, okay? If the thing deposited should earn interest, the depository is under obligation to collect the interest as, as it becomes due and also to take such steps as may be necessary to preserve its value and the rights corresponding to it. Now, let's look at 
the case of um, CA Agro Industrial Development Corporation versus the Court of Appeals and Security Bank and Trust Company, wherein the parties here cited Article 1975 to be the applicable law now in their case. So, kung sa may nahitabo day, aning, um, CA Agro Industrial Development Corp versus Court of Appeals. Uh -huh. Okay. On July 3, 1979, the petitioner here, through its president, Sergio Aguirre, and the spouses Ramon and Paula Pugao, entered into an agreement whereby the former purchased from the latter two parcels of land for a consideration of 350,000 pesos, 625 pesos. Um, of 350,625 pesos. Of this amount, 75,725 pesos was paid as down payment, while the balance was covered by three post-dated checks. Okay? Among the terms of the condition of the agreement embodied in a memorandum of true and actual agreement of sale of land were that the titles to the lots shall be transferred to the petitioner upon full payment of the purchase price and that the owner's copy of the certificates of title thereto um, shall be deposited in a safety deposit box of any bank. Okay? Ang petitioner era is the Agro-Industrial Development Corporation represented by its president, Sergio Aguirre. Okay? So, nipalit sila o yuta parcels of land in, um, to the spouses or from the spouses of Ramon and Paula Pugao. Unya, nag-down sila o 75,000 pesos and then ang balance was covered by three post-dated checks. Ang agreement nila is while wala pa na paid, um, the certificates of title over the parcels of land nga ilang gi palit will be deposited to a safety deposit box of any bank. Okay? Unya, the same could be withdrawn only upon the joint signatures of a representative of the petitioner and the pugaos upon full payment of the purchase price. Okay, muna lang sabot. It can only be withdrawn upon the joint signatures of the representative of the petitioner, si Sergio, and the pugaos, si Ramon and Paula. And then, okay, okay, and the pugaos. All right. Petitioner then, through Sergio Aguirre and the Pugaos, then rented the safety deposit box. Okay? And then, ang ilahang girintahan ng banko is the security bank. Security bank and trust company. For this purpose, both actually signed the contract of lease which contains inter alia the following. So, the, the parties here, the depositors, sila si... Um, um, petitioner and the Pugaos, together with the bank, entered into a contract of lease which contained the following. The bank now is not a depository of the contents of the safe and it has neither the possession nor control of the safe. Another thing is that the bank now has no interest whatsoever in the said contents except herein um, expressly provided and assumes absolute no liability whatsoever in connection with the contract. Muna lang sabot, okay? So, after the execution of the contract, two renters' keys were given to the renters. Okay? Duha ka, Yahweh. Ang usa to agire, katong sa petitioner, nga corporation, the other is to the Pugaos. Okay? Kaning duha ka renters' key. Unya, a guard key remained in the possession of the respondent bank. Okay, na guard key. So, the deposit box has two keyholes. One for the guard key and the other is for the renter's key. So, either of the, of the petitioner and the pugos can actually open it. But, of course, with the guard key. Okay? So, um, the petitioner or the petitioner claims that the certificates of title were actually placed inside the said box. Okay? Thereafter, a certain Mrs. Margarita Ramos offered to buy from the petitioner the two lots at a price of 225 pesos per square meter, which, as petitioner alleged in his complaint, 
translate to a profit of 100 pesos per square meter or a total of 280,500 pesos for the entire property. So, ang netabo, Mrs. Ramos demanded the execution of a deed of sale, which necessarily entailed the production of the certificates and title. So, in view thereof, si Aguirre, katong representative or president of the, of the petitioner corporation, accompanied by the Pugaus, then proceeded to the respondent bank in 1979, October 4, to open the safety deposit box and get the certificates and title. However, when they opened the box in the presence of the bank's representative, the box actually yielded no such certificates. Why so? Ang deposit box. And because of the delay in the reconstitution of the title, si Mrs. Ramos, katong buyer's corporation, withdrew her earlier offer to purchase the lots. And as a consequence thereof, ningon ang petitioner, na they failed kuno, to realize the expected profit of 280,500 pesos. Hence, kaning petitioner, kaning corporation, filed on September 1, 1980, a complaint for damages against the respondent bank with the court of first instance, now the regional trial court of Pasig, which docketed the same as civil case number 38382. All right? So an issue here, is this, is the contractual relation between a commercial bank and another party in a contract of rent of a safety deposit box with respect to its contents placed by the latter, um, one of Baylor and Bailey or one of a lesser and that of a lessee. Okay, again, the issue here is the contractual relation between a commercial bank and another party in a contract of rent of a safety deposit box with respect to its contents placed by the latter, one of Baylor and Bailey or one of Lesser and Lessee. So how did the Supreme Court rule on this one? The Supreme Court said that we agree with the petitioner's contention that the contract for the rent of the safety deposit box is not an ordinary contract of lease as defined in Article 1643 of the Civil Code. However, in the Supreme Court, we do not fully subscribe to the, we do not fully subscribe to the view that the same is a contract of deposit that is to be strictly governed by the provisions of the Civil Code on deposit. The contract in the case at bar is a special kind of deposit. It is kuno a special kind of deposit. Sa pamagiging sa Supreme Court, yung pa ang Supreme Court, it cannot be characterized as an ordinary contract of lease under Article 1643 because the full and absolute possession and control of the safety deposit box was not given to the joint renters, the petitioner and the pugaus. The guard key of the box remained with the respondent back with the respondent bank. And without this key, neither of the renters could open the box. On the other hand, the respondent ba bank could not likewise open the box without the renter's key. In this case, the said key had a duplicate, which was made to that both of the renters could have access to the box. Okay. Further, in the Supreme Court, hence, the authorities cited by the respondent court on this point do not really apply. Neither could Article 1975, also relied by the respondent court, be invoked as an argument against the deposit theory. Obviously, the first paragraph of such provision cannot apply to a depository of certificates, bonds, securities, or instruments which earn interest if such documents are kept in a rented safety deposit box. It is clear that the depositary cannot open the box without the renter being present. Okay? the Supreme Court, we observe, however, that the deposit theory by itself does not altogether find unanimous support even in American jurisprudence. We agree with the petitioner that under the latter, the prevailing rule is that the relation between a bank renting out safe deposit boxes and its customer with respect to the contents of the box is that of a bail or the bailey, the bailment being for hire and mutual benefit. This is just the prevailing view because, according to the Supreme Court, 
there's however some support for the view that the relationship in question might be more properly characterized as that of landlord and tenant or lesser and lessee. It has also been suggested that it should be characterized as that of licensor and licensee. The relation between a bank, a safe deposit company, a storage company, and the renter of a safe deposit box thereof is often described as contractual, express or implied, oral or written, in whole or in part. But there is apparently no jurisdiction in which any rule other than that applicable to bailments governs questions of the liability and rights of the parties in respect of the laws and contents of the safe deposit box. Okay, so mo nangingon siya nga special kind of deposit ni siya. In the context of our laws, the Supreme Court said further, which authorize banking institutions to rent out safety deposit boxes, it is clear that in this jurisdiction, the prevailing rule in the United States has been adopted. That is Section 72 of the General Banking Act pertinently provides that in addition to the operations um, specifically authorized elsewhere in this act, banking institutions other than building and loans association may perform the following services. Una, receiving custody, funds, documents, valuable objects, and rent deposit boxes for safeguarding of such effects. The bank shall also perform such services permitted under subsections. And that of this section as depositaries or as agents. Okay? So with this, the Supreme Court um, said na note ko no, that the primary function is still found within the parameters of a contract of deposit. That is the receiving in custody of funds, documents, and other valuable objects for safekeeping. So the, the Supreme Court posits that the renting out of safety deposit boxes is not independent from but related to or in conjunction with this principal function. A contract of deposit may be entered into orally or in writing. And pursuant to Article 1306 of the Civil Code, the parties thereto may establish such stipulations, clauses, terms, and conditions as may be deemed convenient, provided they are not contrary to law, morals, etc., etc. So the Supreme Court said, um, uh, the depositary's responsibility for the safekeeping of the objects deposited in the case at bar is governed by the Title I, Book Four of the Civil Code, ang, ang Law on Oblicon. So accordingly, the depositary would be liable if, in performing its obligations, it is found guilty of the bus, what we mentioned earlier, if it is found guilty of fraud, negligence, delay, or contravention of the tenor of the agreement, and in the absence of any stipulation prescribing degree of diligence, that of the good father of a family is to be observed. Hence, any stipulation exempting the depositary from any liability arising from the loss of the thing deposited on the account of fraud, negligence, or delay would be void for being contrary to law and public policy. So, mauna, nga niingon ang Supreme Court, nga in this instance, the petitioner maintains that the conditions 13 and 14 of the question contract of lease of the safety deposit box, which reads nga katong dili daw liable si bank as a depository and that the bank has no interest whatsoever um, when it comes to the assumption of liability, ningon na Supreme Court nga these provisions are void because they are contrary to law and public policy. So, ningon pag na Supreme Court, we find ourselves in agreement with this um, proposition, for indeed said provisions are inconsistent with the respondent bank's responsibility as a depository under the General Banking Act. Both exempt the latter from any liability except as contemplated in Condition 8 thereof, which limits its duty to exercise reasonable diligence only with respect to that of the, or only with respect to who shall be admitted to any rented safe. To it, katong the bank shall use diligence that no unauthorized person shall be admitted, etc., etc. For the further, the Supreme Court said na the condition kuno in um, number thirteen stands on a wrong premise, and it's um, and it is contrary to the actual practice of the bank. 
It is not correct to assert that the bank has neither the possession nor the control of the contents of the box, since in fact, the safety deposit box itself is located in its premises and is under its, its absolute control. Okay. Moreover, the respondent bank keeps the key or the guard key to the said box. As stated earlier, renters cannot open their respective boxes unless the bank cooperates by presenting and using this guard key. Clearly then, in the Supreme Court, to the extent above stated, the foregoing conditions in the contract in question are void and ineffective. It has been said in the Supreme Court that with respect to property deposited in a safe deposit box by a customer of a safe um, deposit company, the parties, since the relation is a contractual one, may by special contract define their respective duties or provide for increasing or limiting the liability of the deposit company, provided such contract is not in violation of law or public policy. It must clearly appear that there actually was such a special contract. However, in order to vary the ordinary obligations implied by law from the relationship of the parties, liability of the deposit company will not be enlarged or restricted by words or doubtful or of doubtful meaning. The company in renting safe deposit boxes cannot exempt itself from liability of loss of the contents by its own fraud or negligence or that of its agents or servants. And if a provision of the contract may be construed as an attempt to do so, it will be held ineffective for the purpose. Although it has been said that the lesser of a safety deposit box cannot limit its liability of loss of the contents thereof through its own negligence, the view has been taken that such a lesser may limit its liability to some extent by agreement of um, agreement or stipulation. So, so maginahim ang conclusion ani. Thus, in the Supreme Court, we reached the same conclusion with the Court of Appeals when it arrived at that the petition should be dismissed, but on a grounds quite different from those relied upon by the Court of Appeals. In the Supreme Court, in the instant case, the respondent bank's exoneration cannot, contrary to the holding of the Court of Appeals, be based on or proceeded from the characterization of the impugned contract as a contract of lease, but rather on the fact that no competent proof was presented to show that the respondent bank was aware of the agreement between the petitioner and the Pugaus to the effect that the certificates of title were withdrawable from the deposit box only upon both parties' joint signatures, and that no evidence was submitted to reveal that the loss of the certificates of title was due to fraud or negligence on the part of the bank. This in turn flows from the court's determination that the contract involved here was one of deposit. Okay, Since both the petitioner and the Pugaus agreed that each should have one renter's key, it was obvious that either of them could actually ask the bank for access to the safety deposit box and with the use of such key and the bank's own guard key could open the said box without the other renter being present. Since, however, the petitioner cannot be blamed for the filing of the complaint and no bad faith on its part has been established, the trial court erred in condemning the petitioner to pay the respondent bank attorney's fees. To this extent, the decision of the Public Respondent Court of Appeals must be modified. So this case was partially granted by deleting the award of attorney's fees and modified um, the pronouncement wherein they made the above on the nature of the relationship between the parties in a contract of lease of a safety deposit. The dispositive portion of the said decision 
is hereby affirmed and in the instant petition for reviews otherwise decreed or denied for lack of merit. Okay, so basically um, the Supreme Court was leaning towards considering this kind of contract as that of a contract of deposit rather than that of a contract of lease. Okay, I hope na kuha na ninyo. Uh -huh. Now on to Article 1976. Article 1976 provides that unless there's a stipulation to the contrary, the depository may commingle grains or other articles of the same kind and quality and in which case the various depositors shall own or shall have proportionate interest in the mass. Okay? Ato na ning naisgutan um gamay giniha but as a rule the depository is permitted to commingle grains or other articles of the same kind and quality. And in such a case the various depositors of a goods commingled shall own the entire mass in common and each depositor shall be entitled to such portion of the entire mass in proportion to what they own. But if there is a stipulation to the contrary, the depositary, of course, cannot commingle the goods even if they are of the same kind and quality. On some example, in Article 1976, si Jim, for example, received from Marco um, for deposit mga 30 cavans of rice. And then um, from Alvin, mga 20 cavans. And then from Joe, 10 cavans. So the rice being of the same kind and quality. Parihang uh, ganad doon. Okay? Um, kung wala stipulation to the contrary, in this um, particular case, si Jim can actually commingle the 60 cavans um, and Marco, Alvin, and Joe would become co-owners of the entire 60 cavans in proportion of 30, 20, and 10 respectively. Okay? So pwede rin na siyang mag-commingle. They become co-owners of the entire 60 cavans. Um, of course, ang ilang ownership is in proportion to what they actually own. So that is in 30, 20, and 10 respectively. Siyempre, kung dili sila of the same kind and quality, naturally, ang duty sa depositor is to really keep them separate. Okay? Really keep them separate. Um, 19... Um, 77, um, this provides that the depositor cannot make use of the thing deposited without the express permission of the depositor. Otherwise, you shall be liable for damages. However, when the preservation of the thing deposited requires its use, it must be used but only for that purpose. We already discussed this. Kaneng Article 1977, um, and I think you have already... Um, got that 1978 when the depositary has permission to use the thing deposited the contract loses the concept of a deposit and becomes a loan or comodatum except of course where safekeeping is still the principal purpose of the contract the permission shall not be presumed and its existence must be um, proved um, as what we have always emphasized earlier kung safekeeping Ang principal purpose of the contract, it is still deposit, but it is called a regular deposit. Okay? It is, since it is an irregular one, we call this an irregular um, deposit. And then, um, kanos aman ang depository liable for the loss of the thing through fortuitous event. Um, ba in comodatum, um, generally, di man liable si Bailey for the loss of the thing due to fortuitous event, except in Article 1942 because, ba, as a general rule, um, a person may not be um, held liable for a thing which may not have been foreseen or if foreseen is inevitable. But of course, um, because, but of course, ningon mismo ang balawad na except when the law so provides, okay? And in this case, an exception sa komodatum is Article 1942. It is what the law so provides. The same is true or the same rule is um, applicable in deposit. Generally, this is liable for fortuitous event. But there are exceptions. And the exceptions um, are actually enumerated in Article 1979. Article 1979 um, 
uh, provides that the depository is liable for the loss of the thing through a fortuitous event if it is so stipulated, if he uses the thing without the depositor's permission, if he delays its return, and if he allows others to use it even though he himself may have been authorized to use the same. Okay, so basically these are the exceptions wherein the depositary may be held liable for the loss of the thing even if um, the loss was due to a fortuitous event. The man ilang na, 1979. Okay? Um, suppose si Jim went to BPI and then nag-open siya rito time deposit. Okay? What law shall govern their contractual relationship? Kung sa may mo govern na balaod aning uh, um, relationship? Is it a contract of deposit or what is it? Uh, the law would tell us in Article 1980 nga fixed savings and current deposits of money in banks and similar institutions shall be governed by the provisions concerning simple loan. Okay, simple loan. Ang nangutang ani ang banko. Okay, kita ang mga credit. Creditor, yes, we are the creditor of the bank. So this contractual obligation or contractual relationship is actually governed by the provisions concerning simple loan. Now you might ask, um, are these irregular deposits, attorney? The answer, of course, is no, because in the first place, di manisha deposit, contract of loan manisha, simple loan man ang govern ang niya. Okay, but the SC had the occasion to tell us that these kind of transactions are in the nature, in the nature of an irregular deposit because the bank now has the right to use money we deposited to them. Okay? Um, I, ako lang siyang ipaagi, um, uh, I, I like to emphasize that um, the business of banking is one imbued with public interest. Okay? Morning game on the Supreme Court in City State Bank versus Teresita Tobias and Shelly D. Valdez decided in March 7, 2018. Ngayon ang Supreme Court nga, the business of banking is imbued with public interest. As such, banking institutions are obliged to exercise the highest degree of diligence as well as high standards of integrity and performance in all its transactions. The law expressly imposes upon the banks a fiduciary duty towards its clients and to treat in this regard the accounts of its depositors and or with meticulous care. The contract between the bank and its depositor is governed by the provisions of the civil code on simple loan or mutuo with the bank as a debtor and the depositor as the creditor. Kita ang creditor. In light of these, banking institutions may be held liable for damages for failure to exercise the diligence required of it resulting to contractual breach or where the act or omission complained of constitutes an actionable tort. Okay, remember nga ang degree of diligence required from banks is extraordinary diligence. It is the highest form of diligence or highest degree of diligence. Okay? Kaya nga naman, ang rason na ginana because ang business of banking is imbued with public interest. Since it is impressed with public interest, dapat lang nga ang degree of diligence na kailangan nilang i-exercise is that of the highest degree or extraordinary degree of diligence. Alright? I hope klaro na. Um, articles 1981, um, 1982, um, and 19, um, 1983 are actually matters of reading. So, voice So just um, read through those articles. Um, we've touched this in the preliminaries. So, dalit na lang na siyang subdun. Okay, masala na lang guys. Now, um, can the depositor prove or can the depository demand that the depositor prove his ownership? Article 1984 would tell us ha, nga, the depository who receives a thing in deposit cannot require that the depositor prove his ownership over the thing. And should there be um, 
an instance wherein he discovers that the thing has been stolen and who its true owner is. The, his obligation is to advise the true owner of the deposit. And if the true owner, in spite of such information, does not, does not claim the thing deposited within a period of one month, the depositary shall be relieved of all responsibility by returning the thing deposited to the depositor. Now, if the depositary has reasonable grounds to believe that the thing has not been lawfully acquired by the depositor, the former may return the same. Monangingon sa Article 1984. Now, you might ask, pwede ba ang depositary mo require um, for the presentation of an ID? Um, it would appear that the answer is yes because proof of identification is actually different from proof of ownership. Now, another question. Pwede ba nga si depositary would require the presentation of a receipt of the thing deposited? Pwede. As we've said, it is also it is only a proof of identification and not of ownership. Um, so kung yun ani, na dili din na to ma-require or dili ka demand na i-prove ni depositary or ni depositor ang niyang ownership over the thing, what should we do? Or what should be ascertained at the very least when it comes to a contract of deposit? Well, authority to make deposit should be ascertained. Pwede man mo nang ma-ascertain. Take note lang that this provision um, provided for or the, the prohibition actually applies subsequent to the deposit. Okay? Um, before the deposit, the proof of ownership may be required. Okay? Um, labi na kung you're in the business of you know, storing goods. So this is just um, a form of exercising due diligence. This There is um, required due diligence review in this instance. So at the very least, you may ascertain the authority to make the deposit. And since this is done before um, the deposit is made, this is, not a, this is not a violation of Article 1984. Okay. Okay. Um, Article um, 18 or 1985 to 1991 are also matters of reading. So please take note lang ang ng mga articles. Um, ako lang um, i-emphasize in Article 1991. Here, di ba, if you see Article 1991, siya the depositor's heir who in good faith may have sold the thing which he did not know was deposited shall be bound to return the price he may have received or to assign his right of action against the buyer in case the price has not been paid by him. Kaning giingon din nga depositor's heir, um, di siya depositor ha, it's a typo error. This should mean depositary. Okay? The depositary's heir. Okay? So, butangin lang na ninyo o mark diha ang depositor to that of depositary. So, the depositary's heir who in good faith, etc., etc. That's in Article 19. 91. Now on to the obligations of the depositor. So may mga obligations sa depositor. Article 1992 says that if the deposit is gratuitous, the depositor is obliged to reimburse the depositary for the expenses he may have incurred for the preservation of the thing. Okay, For the preservation of of the thing. So, unsa may mga obligation um, or unsa may mga expenses na kailangan by rent. Okay? In terms of um, a deposit or a gratuitous deposit, okay, this article applies to that particular kind of deposit. Okay? This would only apply to gratuitous deposit. Nga naman, it is, it is just a matter of equity. No? It rests on equity. The depositor would have incurred just the same had the thing remained with him. So without the duty of reimbursement imposed by the article, the depositor would be enriching himself at the expense of the depositary. Kung ano mang gani, di iyan na lang i-deposit dito. Dili na lang na niya sa iya siya mag-alaga because ma-exempt din siya from liability over the expenses thereof. Diba? Um, um, for the preservation of the thing deposited. 
the rule, however, is different in incomodatum, if you remember, di ba? Kay incomodatum, ang liable din to kay si Bailey man for the ordinary expenses sa use and preservation. It, this is, of course, um, reasonable and logical. Kaya nga naman, incomodatum, nagamit man si Bailey. Pero sa deposit, si depositary may nahasol kay ang iyang rule is to safely keep the property, di ba? But in terms of deposit per compensation, if the deposit is for a valuable consideration, the expenses of preservation are to be borne by the depositary because they are deemed included in the compensation. Okay? But of course, there can be a contrary stipulation. Pwede rin na. But generally, ang obligation would rest on the depositary kung kana siya nga kind of deposit is that of a deposit with a compensation or deposit for compensation. Now, let's um, look at 1993. Ang 1993 provides that the depositor shall reimburse the depositary for any loss arising from the character of the thing deposited unless at the time of the constitution of the deposit, the former was not aware of or was not expected to know the dangerous character of the thing or unless he notified the depositary of the same or the latter was aware of it without advice from the depositor. Okay? As a rule, the depositary must be reimbursed for the loss suffered by him because of the character of the thing deposited. Unless, of course, at the time of the constitution, mo nang may exception, at the time of the constitution of the deposit, the depositor was not aware of or was not expected to know the dangerous character of the thing or unless he notified the depositary of the same or the latter was aware of it without advice from the depositor. Now on to Article 1994. 1994 provides that the depositary may retain the thing in pledge until the full payment of what may be due by him or due him by reason of the deposit. This actually talks about legal pledge. Okay, The thing retained serves as a security for payment of what may be due to the depositary by reason of the deposit. So here, the depositary may actually foreclose the thing na um, deposited through legal pledge through a public auction. Okay? Oof. So, okay. 1995. Um, this talks about the instance where or instances where in the contract of deposit is extinguished. Okay? So, upon kanus aman may extinguish ang contract of deposit um, first, upon the loss or destruction of the thing deposited, or in case of a gratuitous deposit, upon the death or either the deposit of either the depositor or the depositary. Remember, na kung ang deposit is for a compensation, dili na siya may extinguish by the death of either party, because in this case, it is not a personal, um, purely personal um, kind of obligation. So it will survive, and ang um, mupuling a parties would be the heirs, the signs of either of the party nga mamatay. Okay? Um, okay. So, can I, let's discuss this case. Maria Barreto versus Leona Reyes. This is a very old case, but a very good example of discussing um, the concept of deposit. So, this was decided in March 21, 1908. Um, in this case, the transaction um, was, according to the Supreme Court, the transaction was not that of a deposit. Although, ang term magigamit sa parties is that of deposit. Atong tanahan kung saan nitabo. So, ang nitabo ani in 1898, June 30, 1898, the defendant and Marcelo Dominguez, the plaintiff's intestate, um, executed an agreement containing the following clause. Una, ningon nga ay Doña Leona Reyes, the widow of Don Teodoro Dorante, do hereby acknowledge that I have in this date received from Don Marcelo Dominguez, a peninsular Spaniard married 
and a resident of this town the amount of 7,556 kavans of palay as a deposit without interest, which palay, clean and of good weight, I promise to deliver at the store of Senor Dominguez on or before June 15 of the next year, that is 1899. Okay, tanawa ha, ang, ang provision ha, ng promisia nga um, mo deliver sa gideposit ko no nga the amount of the 7,556 kavans of palay. The amount of the 7,556 kavans of palay. In, in case, further ha, ang, ilang, ang iyang promise niyon, in case that the aforesaid date, I am not able to deliver the whole amount of the kavans as above stated, I promise to liquidate any undelivered balance and reduce the same to money at the highest price for which the product may be sold in Nueva Caseras and the resulting amount I likewise agree to pay for in Palay, clean and of good weight, at this store on the June or in the 15th of June of the following year, 1900, at the rate of 30 provincial gantas of each peso. Okay? We will find out later on. So, um, Further, na found out sa Supreme Court na the, the, the testimony established kono these additional facts. That the defendant had in reality received from Dominguez not palay but money. Quarta dili ang palay. Estimated according to a standard not shown as the equivalent of the palay mentioned the result of the settlement of the previous transactions between them. That during the absence of Dominguez from the province, he left his affairs in charge of an agent whose powers included the carrying out of this contract and that the defendant made delivery on account amounting to 253.5 kavans, leaving a, a, a balance, leaving a balance of 7,302 and a half kavans and delivered. And on May 14, 1903, the defendant offered in writing to settle at two pesos a kavan. Okay, two pesos a kavan. So, ngon na Supreme Court to take judicial notice of the fact that a kavan contains 25 gantas. Okay. This peculiar contract, according to the Supreme Court, locally known as Bulbulawin, Bulbulawin, presents difficulties of construction, but is not necessarily unconscionable, although its event is at the risk of the market. There is, in fact, no deposit, okay? No deposit. And such is not the true nature of her transaction. The distant capitalist contributes his money with which the local merchant is to buy a stock of palay, having the entire season ahead in which to take advantage of the fluctuations in the market and the necessities of the local growers before the amount due in palay is delivered or its value is liquidated when an additional season in which to make himself good in the amount ascertained by the liquidation. The fixing of the ultimate price of one peso for three gantas, equivalent to one and a half kavans, obviously secures the party advancing the money against a fall in price during the second, year, the second year while not depriving the dealer of the opportunity to buy at the cheapest rate in interval. Nakakuha mo guys? Ano yung tabuan niya? Ang yahatag atong don, tong Senor Dominguez, is actually money. Okay? Niya katunga kwarta will be used by the supposed depository in this case to buy palays. Okay? So, depende na na kung makaganan siya siya or di siya makaganan siya depending on the season. Munang gi-advance ang, ang kwarta. So, munang nihingo ng Supreme Court, this is not a contract of deposit. Okay? Um, kani siya nga kontrata nga kaning ila, by custom it's called bulbu lawin is not a contract of deposit. Huh? But um, it is a different kind of transaction. 
Further, in the Supreme Court, in this instance, it seems that about the date of the contract, the price of Palay was under one peso. But owing to rinder pest among the working cattle and to the insurrection, the quotation steadily rose, a time reaching from five to six pesos a cavan. So the trial judge assessed the damages at the market price on the date of his decision, giving a judgment um, for the return of 7,302.5 cavans or the recovery of its value at the rate of 3 pesos a cavan. We are of the opinion that he should rather have followed the method of ascertaining damage provided in the contract itself, which involved no illegality and no oppressive penalty. Okay? So in the Supreme Court, ay yung pagbutbot, pagpintada, sunda tong nasa kontrata. And ang nasa kontrata, Ningon nga, there was much conflicting, uh, I mean, the Supreme Court said further that there was much conflicting um, testimony as to the value of the grain at different periods, and especially in the year 1900s, owing to the disordered condition of the country. So the Supreme Court further said that the date of liquidation was set as June 15, 1899, and the price in that year has been variously estimated by different witnesses. Okay? So dapat ni na Supreme Court, this should be the measure of damages as is as is seen from following up the process of the contract. contrata. So the next step according to which is to ascertain the equivalent of the sum in Kavan Sampalay at the rate of 30 gantas. That is to say at the rate of 0.83 pesos one third for each Kavan resulting to 13,114 Kavans. So this is the quality of Palay to the delivery of which the plaintiff under the contract is entitled and the amount of money to which in default of such delivery she has a right to be paid as its value at that time at the contract rate of 0.83 one third to with ten thousand nine hundred fifty three point seventy five cents with interest. So in other words, the effect of the contract is to fix the damages by the price of the date of liquidation although finally payable one year thereafter. So basically, ang giklaro sa Supreme Court, bisan pag ang gipanganin nyo ng kontratahan deposit, um, kung makita ang nature sa transaction that it is not a contract of deposit, we will of course not reduce that kind of contract as that of deposit. Okay? So muna yung judgment sa court. All right. So let's now proceed to necessary deposit. Okay, gamay na lang. Necessary deposit. Um, when is deposit necessary? Ang Article 1996 um, would tell us that a deposit is necessary when it is made in compliance with the legal obligation or when it takes, it, when it takes place on the occasion of any calamity such as fire, storm, flood, pillage, shipwreck, or other similar events. So, kano sa man nga it is made um, in compliance with the legal obligation? So, may mga examples, ani. Um, makita na ninyo um, in Article 538, judicial deposit of the thing, the possession of which is being disputed in litigation by two or more persons, um, the deposit to the bank or public um, institution of public bonds, um, those required in suits as provided in the rules of court, those constituted to guarantee contracts to the government cannot, these are basically a deposit um, in compliance with the legal obligation. Now, paragraph two of 1996 provides um, that um, there is also a necessary deposit when it takes place on the occasion of any calamity, um, such as um, fire, storm, flood, pillage, shipwreck, or other similar um, events. Example, ani, um, in case of a death, um, unya, na anod, let's say, ang waterproof television ni Jim, nga to kang Marco. Um, si Marco, in this case, nga nagakuha sa waterproof television, would be considered a depositary by virtue of this um, particular provision. Okay? Um, I hope that's clear. Um, okay, Article 1997. Um, is basically self-explanatory. 
um, it says that the deposit referred to in number one of the preceding article shall be governed by the provisions of the law establishing it and in case of its deficiency by the rules of voluntary deposit. Um, the deposit mentioned in number two on one hand um, shall be regulated by the provisions concerning voluntary deposit and by Article 2168. All right, um, jump lang to Article 2168 for you to be able to know kung on All right. Um, 1998 and 1999. Um, allow me to read this lang. Huh? Um, 1998 provides that the deposit of effects made by the travelers in hotels or inns shall also be regarded as necessary. The hotels or the keepers or inns shall be um, responsible for them as depositaries provided that notice was given to them or to their employees of the effects brought by the guest and that on the part of the latter they take the precautions which the said hotel keepers or their substitutes advised relative to the care and vigilance of their effects. 1999 provides that the hotel keeper is liable for the vehicles, animals, and articles which have been introduced or placed in the annexes of the hotel. Okay. Um, articles 1998 and 1999 talk about the extent of liability of the keepers of hotels and inns. So let's discuss the case of Durban Apartments Corporation um, versus Pioneer Insurance and Surety Corporation which basically um, exemplifies and cites these provisions, okay? So, unsa man din itabuan eh, unsa man din kasuha. This is actually a case review in the decision of the Court of Appeals in CAGR number 8686, etc., etc., holding the petitioner Dorban Apartments Corporation solely liable to the respondent Pioneer Insurance Insurity Corporation for the loss of Jeffrey C's vehicle. Okay? So, um, naningil basically ang insurance here um, because of um, the loss of Jeffrey C's vehicle. So, what's something that you want Pag July 22, 2003, Ang respondent here, the Pioneer Insurance and Surety Corporation, by right of subrogation, filed, filed a complaint for recovery of damages against the petitioner, Durban Apartments Corporation, um, and the defendant, Vicente Hustimbaste. Okay? Vicente Hustimbaste. Um, the respondent here, um, allege that it is the insurer for loss and damage of Jeffrey C's um, 20 or 2001 Suzuki Grand Vitara car um, and, and under policy MCCV um, 003846-00D and the amount of 1,175,000 pesos. Okay? So sila ang insurer sa um, sakinan ni Jeffrey C. Nganawa. So on April 30, 2002, C. arrived and checked in at the City Garden Hotel in Makati, corner Kalayhaan Avenues, before midnight. And its parking attendant, Defendant Hostim Baste. Okay? Uh, by the way, Kani City Garden Hotel is actually the business name of Durban Apartments Corporation. Okay? So, um, Naabot dito si C in April 30, 2002 at midnight and um, or before midnight and its parking attendant, parking attendant sa City Garden Hotel, si Houston Baste, got the key to the said Vitara from C to park it. Okay? On May 1, 2001, at about 1 o'clock in the morning, C was awakened in his room by a telephone call from Hotel Chief Security Officer who informed him that his Vitara Kono was carnapped while it was parked unattended at the parking area of Equitable PCI Bank along Makati Avenue between the hours of 12 a.m. and 11 a.m. 
C then went to see the hotel chief security officer and thereafter reported the incident to the operations division of the Makati City Anti-Carnapping Unit and a flash alarm was issued. Dayun, the Makati City Police Anti-Carnapping Unit investigated Hotel Security Officer Ernesto Horlador and the defendant Hostin Baste. C gave his sinumpaang salaysay to the police investigator and filed the complaint sheet with the PNT Traffic Management Group and Camp Krame. Dayun, the Vitara has not yet been discovered since July 23, 2002 as evidenced by a certification of non-recovery issued by PNT TMG. And then um, si, um, insurer ko no, the respondent paid the amount of 1,163,250 um, pesos, money claim of C, and mortgagee ABN AMRO Savings Bank as indemnity for the loss of the Vitara. According to them, Pagyo, the Vitara was lost due to the negligence of Durban Apartments and Hustimbaste because it was discovered during the investigation that this was the second time that a similar incident of car napping happened in the valley parking service of Durban Apartments and no necessary precautions no, were taken to prevent its repetition. Nya, lingon pag ng respondent nga Durban Apartments was wanting in due diligence in the selection and supervision of its employees, particularly the defendant Hustimbaste. And the defendant Hustimbaste and the petitioner Durban Apartments failed and refused to pay its valid, just, and lawful claim despite such demands or despite written demands. Upon the service of someone's Durban Apartments and Defendant Hostembaste filed their answer with compulsory counterclaim alleging that yun sila ha, si Kuno did not check in at the hotel. On the contrary, he was a guest of a certain Ching Montero. And Defendant Hostembaste did not get the ignition key of C's Vitara. On the contrary, it was si Kuno who requested a parking attendant to park the Vitara at any available parking space. And it was parked at an equitable or at the equitable bank parking area, which was within C's view, while he and Montero were waiting in front of the hotel. Ningun pagyud ang um, petitioner here nga, they made a written denial of the demand of the respondent pioneer insurance for want of legal basis. And that um, they the valley parking services are provided by the hotel for the convenience of its customers looking for a parking space near the hotel premises. It is a special privilege that it gave to Mintero and C and that it does not include responsibility for any losses, damages to motor vehicles and its accessories in the parking area. So upon the service of someone's, I mean, Okay. So, um, ngayon pag sila nga at the same um, time, um, it is or it was si Kono himself who parked his vitara um, within the premises at, of the hotel as evidenced by the valley parking customer's claim stub issued to him. The car na per Kono was able to um, um, open the Vitara without using the key given earlier to the parking attendant and subsequently turned over to C after Vitara was stolen. Defendant Hostin Baste saw the Vitara speeding away from the place where it was parked. Yeah, lain pag hindi na dipinsa, si Hostin Baste kuna tried to run after it and then blocked its possible path but to no avail. Ha? Ni blockan pag hindi And C kuna was duly and immediately informed of the car napping of his Vitara and then the matter you know, was reported to the nearest police station and the defendant of Simbaste and Harlador submitted themselves to police investigation. Okay. So the issue here that actually re reached the Supreme Court is whether the petitioner here, Durban Apartments Corporation, is liable to respondent for the loss of C's vehicle. You know, the Supreme Court, ane? the Supreme Court said that in this case, Respondent substantiated the allegations in its complaint. That is, a contract of necessary deposit existed between the insured C 
and the petitioner. On this score, we find no error in the following disquisition of the appellate court that the records also reveal that upon arrival at the City Garden Hotel, C gave notice to the doorman and parking attendant of the said hotel and that was Timbaste about his bitara when he entrusted its ignition key to the latter. Was Timbaste issued a valet parking customer claim stub to C Park the Vitara at Equitable PCI Banking um, Bank parking area and place the ignition key inside a safety key box while C proceeded to the hotel lobby to check in. The Equitable PCI Bank parking area and in the Supreme Court became an annex of the City Garden Hotel when the management of the said bank allowed the parking of the vehicles of hotel guests thereat in the evening after banking hours. Further, the Supreme Court said that Article 1962 in relation to Article 1998 of the Civil Code defines a contract of deposit and necessary deposit made by persons in hotels or inns as follows. Katotong diba sa ganiha, diba? Pointly or plainly, from the facts found by the lower courts, the insured C deposited his vehicle for safekeeping with Petitioner through the latter's employee, Hostim Baste. In turn, Hostim Baste issued a claim stub huh, to see. Thus, the contract of deposit was perfected from C's delivery when he handed over to Hostim Baste the keys to his vehicle, which Hostim Baste received with the obligation of safely keeping and returning it. Ultimately, the petitioner in this case is liable for the loss of C's vehicle. Okay, so that's the case of um, Dorban Apartment Corporation versus the Pioneer Insurance Corporation. Now on to... Okay, kanila siya. Article 2000, 2001, let's read this together, 2002. Ngayon ang Article 2000, the respondent referred to in the two preceding, uh, respondent, sorry, the responsible referred, the responsibility referred to in the two preceding articles shall include the loss of or injury to the personal property of the guests caused by the servants or employees of the keepers of the hotels or inns as well as strangers but not which may proceed from any force majeure. The fact that travelers are constrained to rely on the vigilance of the keeper of the hotels or inns shall be considered in determining the degree of care required of him. Timan ilang ni guys ha, kaning dre sa Article 2000 in relation to 2001, ma force majeure na ng sa kabutang labi na ang act of a thief or a robber who has entered the hotel when it is done with the use of arms or through an irresistible force. Kung pareha itong nahitabo sa Durban na gikarnap without the use of arms, without proof that there was use of arms, diretsura, um, of course, liable ang hotel. But if there was force majeure, force majeure as defined in Article 2001, kana siya um, ma-exempt or ma-exonerate ang hotel for the liability. All right? In 2002, the hotel keeper is not liable for um, compensation if the loss is due to the acts of the guests, his family, servants, or um, visitors, or if the loss arises from the character of the things brought into the hotel. Okay, um, I think that's um, self-explanatory. And then this one, um, Kanin, 2003, remember, the hotel keeper cannot free himself from responsibility by posting notices to the effect that he is not liable for the articles brought to the guest. Tigino po yun nakasutin, kita kag mga notices niya. They cannot um, free themselves from liability. That's in 2003. Any stipulation between the hotel keeper and the guest whereby the responsibility of the former as set forth in 1998 to 2001 is suppressed or diminished shall be void. Void nga po na. Bisag na po mo yung kontrata. Dahil the hotel keeper has a right to retain the things brought into the hotel by the guest as a security for credits on the account of lodging, 
um, and supplies usually furnished to hotel guests. So, okay. So, uh, um, in fact, in article, um, in the case of YHT Realty versus CA, um, um, which actually cites Article Two Thousand Three of the Civil Code. Um, it provides that the hotel keeper cannot free himself from responsibility diba, by posting um, so-and-so. Um, the Supreme Court said that Article 2003 was incorporated in the new civil code as an expression of public policy precisely to apply to situations such as that, the, such that presented in this case. The hotel business, like common carriers, business is imbued with public interest. Huh? Mura pugbango ba? Imbued with public interest. Catering to the public, hotel keepers are bound to provide not only lodging for hotel guests and security to their persons and belongings. The twin duty constitutes the essence of the business. The law, in turn, does not allow such duty to the public to be negated or diluted by any contrary stipulation in a so-called undertakings that ordinarily appear in prepared forms imposed by hotel keepers on guests for their signature. Okay? So, basahalang po ng YHT Realty versus Court of Appeals for you to be able to understand this case fully. Okay? And then, kanin, sequestration, we have already discussed this and I'm sure you will have an extensive discussion um, of this um, particular concept or of these articles um, when you reach uh, remedial law. So I hope klaro na as a recap, um, deposit, the principal purpose of deposit is for safekeeping and then it is um, it may be constituted either judicially or extrajudicially and when we talk about extrajudicially, this may be further classified into a voluntary or necessary deposit. When it comes to judicial, um, um, an instance wherein attachment or seizure of property in litigation is actually ordered. So I hope you learned something tonight. I really apologize for not being able to conduct this um, live earlier because I had um, an issue with my internet connection. But I'll try my best to um, have a, or to find a better connection in the next meeting. So thank you very much for listening. I hope to see you guys next meeting. Good night.